It's Thursday, April 22nd. President Biden convenes a virtual global climate summit with an announcement that the United States will cut its fossil fuel emissions in half by the end of the decade. The United States sets out on the road to cut greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. That's where we're headed as a nation. And that's what we can do if we take action to build an economy that's not only more prosperous, but healthier, fair, and cleaner for the entire planet. Environmental groups demand the U.S. go farther, faster. The Center for Biological Diversity says the pledge to cut emissions 50% by 2030 simply not big enough to meet the massive scale of the climate emergency. 20-year-old Dante Wright shot to death by an officer who said she mistook her service pistol for her taser, remembered at his funeral in Minnesota today as a dedicated father whose life was ended too soon at the hands of police. Civil rights leader, the Reverend Al Sharpton, delivers a thundering eulogy, promising that black people will never shut up and suffer and that changes to federal law are coming. Some say, Reverend Al, police are human. Well, we knew that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have sent you through training. But we assume when you come through that you were trained. Train people. Don't confuse guns from tasers. A day after 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant shot and killed by a Columbus officer, demonstrations spread through the Ohio City as protesters there demand police accountability. The Senate today overwhelmingly passes a bill to help combat the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, a bipartisan denunciation of such violence during the coronavirus pandemic. The University of California and California State University announced they will require COVID-19 vaccinations for all students, faculty, and staff this fall. The House of Representatives approves a bill that would turn the nation's capital into the 51st state. And Senate Republicans unveiled their plan for rebuilding the nation's infrastructure. It's just a two-page outline, and it's just one-fourth the size of President Biden's proposal. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. As President Biden today opened a global climate summit with world leaders, including China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin, he announced a promise to cut U.S. carbon emissions in half by the year 2030. Reporter Ariel Boone looked into Biden's record on climate change in his first 100 days in office. She files this report. Climate change activists say President Biden's first three months in office have been a mixed bag. John Paul Mejia is an organizer for the Sunrise Movement. The victory was delivered for Joe Biden from lots of voters who witnessed ambitious plans come out later in the campaign and elected him on a progressive mandate for systemic action on racism, COVID and climate. And that's why Joe Biden was elected. Is he following through with every single campaign promise? That's hard to believe right now. The Sunrise Movement is championing a Green New Deal, a group of policies that would transition the United States from using fossil fuels to 100% renewable energy by 2030. But Biden hasn't supported the Green New Deal. Instead, he's proposing an infrastructure plan that would invest $2.2 trillion in green energy, electric vehicles, modernizing the electrical grid, plugging abandoned oil wells, and cleaning up pollution that harms communities of color. It would also kickstart a small version of a green jobs program called the Civilian Climate Corps. But Mejia says it's not enough. It's way more spending than any stimulus bill or any effort on climate from the Obama administration. But if we're talking about addressing this crisis at the speed, scope and scale necessary that 
he's so touted during the campaign trail, then this is a really crummy plan. This is not to the extent that we need it to be. It's clearly a result of organizing by climate activists that the Biden infrastructure plan is on the table, says Mejia, but the investment needs to be five times larger. We have to decrease and slash emissions at the most ambitious rate, anywhere from 60 percent to 100 percent over the next 10 years. We need to decarbonize our economy and and take it from a carbon intensive one to a zero carbon one. If the problem is big, we got to invest big and invest in our people too. 10 trillion over the next decade is really what we need. Since taking office, Biden has rejoined the 2015 Paris Climate Accord and halted the Keystone XL pipeline. In January, he signed a major executive order on the climate, committing to end public financing and subsidies for fossil fuels. But the U.S. is the third largest exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world and growing. Two thirds of that comes from fracking. And the day Biden signed the executive order on climate, he said this. Let me be clear. And I know this always comes up. We're not going to ban fracking. Lauren Stockman follows the oil and gas industry very closely. He's senior research analyst with Oil Change International. And he sees the Biden administration under heavy industry pressure to keep promoting natural gas. We've seen kind of disparate statements from different parts of the administration. For example, Secretary Granholm talking about the importance of, 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 of U.S. liquefied natural gas exports. We've seen Kerry a couple of months ago saying, you know, we should be careful not to build more gas infrastructure because we'll be stranded assets. And then a month later, say that gas is a bridge fuel in the energy transition. And that, Stockman says, is a mistake, one that the Obama administration also made. They have to be very careful not to make some of the mistakes of previous Democratic administrations and try and move forward on climate without upsetting certain parts of the energy industry. They can't do this without upsetting somebody. And that somebody is going to be large oil and gas corporations, companies that are determined to pursue the status quo. You know, frankly, the folks at the American Petroleum Institute who are fundamentally against and ideologically opposed to anything that challenges oil and gas production growth, they're not going to be able to keep those people happy while moving forward on the climate action that we need to see. During Biden's second week in office, he halted all new leases for offshore oil and gas drilling on federal lands and waters. He also put a moratorium on drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. But his record on oil and gas pipeline approvals has been timid. My Lakota name is Eagle Feather Woman, but my American name is Joy Braun. I'm a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Joy Braun lives on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. She was part of a protest camp at Standing Rock. And she organizes with the Indigenous Environmental Network, traveling to help communities protect water and lands against encroaching pipelines. No matter what happens in Indian country, we need to remember that there needs to be free, prior, informed consent before any type of projects come into or onto our tribal lands or our treaty lands, not just reservation lands, but also our treaty lands. <laughs> On April 9th, Biden administration lawyers announced they would not try to shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline while it undergoes environmental review, even though it's currently operating illegally and unpermitted and in violation of an 1868 treaty, according to the Standing Rock Sioux. I asked Braun what she thought about Biden's pipeline policy so far. I think it's cowardly. He, he promised that he was going to put tribal nations first. And that makes a great sound bite. That's like, oh, yeah, great, awesome, we're going to do that. Above all, we're going to uphold our trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations. But then in practice, they don't really do it. I think that if he wants to truly prove that he's putting tribal interests first, he needs to start with the Dakota Access Pipeline and uh, Line 3 Pipeline and stop them. Biden has taken no action to oppose the Line 3 tar sands pipeline, which indigenous organizers are fighting to stop in northern Minnesota. Construction on the Enbridge Line 3 project has already been linked to sexual assaults along its route. And according to Braun, indigenous water protectors are facing the worst surveillance, policing, and criminalization they've seen. She's calling on Biden to warrior up. Biden and the other 
congressional uh, delegates and senators really need to start putting their foot down and not be bought off by these corporations. No, oh, he needs to be brave and he needs to be bold and he needs to find it in his power to, to lawyer up. For KPFA News in Oakland, I'm Ariel Boone. President Joe Biden did announce today the most ambitious U.S. climate action ever. At a virtual climate leaders summit, Biden pledged to cut the nation's greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52 percent by the year 2030, nearly doubling the reductions that President Barack Obama pledged in the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. While world leaders met at the climate summit, Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg testified at a House hearing calling on lawmakers to take bold action or they will fare poorly in the history books that will be written by her generation. Christopher Martinez reports. On the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, President Joe Biden has announced an ambitious agenda to slash fossil fuel emissions compared to 2005 levels, with a goal of reaching net zero emissions by the year 2050 at the latest. The United States sets out on the road to cut greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. That's where we're headed as a nation. And that's what we can do if we take action to build an economy that's not only more prosperous, but healthier, fair and cleaner for the entire planet. Biden laid out a broad agenda that includes putting people to work developing cutting-edge batteries, building a more efficient energy grid, and capping abandoned oil and gas rigs and coal mines. He made his pledge at the start of a virtual Leaders' Summit on Climate. The event was held by live stream because of the COVID pandemic, but that didn't stop 40 world leaders from taking part. German Chancellor Angela Merkel welcomed the U.S. back to the work on climate politics. Four years after, then-President Donald Trump announced he would pull the U.S. out of the Paris Accords. South Korea announced it would halt all public financing of coal-fired power plants. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said, This is not bunny-hugging, this is about growth and jobs. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres sounded a dire warning, saying, We need a green planet, but the world is on red alert. Mother Nature is not waiting. The past decade was the hottest on record. Dangerous greenhouse gases are at levels not seen in three million years. Global temperature has already risen 1.2 degrees Celsius, racing towards the threshold of catastrophe. At a White House news conference, Special Envoy on Climate John Kerry praised Biden's commitments, but he also emphasized the work to be done ahead of a United Nations climate meeting called COP26, scheduled to take place in Glasgow in November. I, I'm pleased with where we are, but I'm, I'm not sanguine. Uh, the next six months of diplomacy are going to be absolutely critical to the capacity to make Glasgow what it needs to be. I do believe Glasgow remains our last best hope to be able to coalesce the world in the right direction and to get the critical mass of countries of the 20 biggest emitters uh, who are responsible for 81 percent of all the emissions. While the Global Climate Summit was taking place, a House Oversight Committee was holding a hearing on the impact of the fossil fuel industry on the environment. Silicon Valley Congressmember Ro Khanna called for an end to massive subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, noting that last year the industry got more than $30 billion in subsidies and pandemic relief. Teenage climate campaigner Greta Thunberg testified at the hearing, calling fossil fuel subsidies a disgrace. She called for a halt to fossil fuel exploration and extraction, divestment from fossil fuels, and keeping carbon in the ground. And it may seem like we are asking for a lot. And you will, of course, say that we are naive, and that's fine. But at least we are not so naive that we believe things will be solved through countries and companies making vague, distant, insufficient targets without any real pressure from the media and the general public. So either you do this, or you're going to have to start to explain to your children and the most affected people why you are surrendering on the 1.5 degree target given up without even trying. 
Some environmental groups, like the Sunrise Movement and the Center for Biological Diversity, are calling for even bolder action. They say the Biden administration's plans are not enough to meet the scale of the climate emergency. At the House hearing, Swedish activist Stunberg says people in power are ignoring the climate crisis and getting away with the continued destruction of present and future living conditions. You still have time to do the right thing and to save your legacies. But that window of time is not going to last for long. What happens then? We, the young people, are the ones who are going to write about you in the history books. We are the ones who get to decide how you will be remembered. So my advice for you is to choose wisely. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. And this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. During an emotional funeral in Minnesota today, civil rights leader the Reverend Al Sharpton eulogized Dante Wright, the young black man shot by a police officer during a traffic stop in suburban Minneapolis, as not just some kid with an air freshener, but a prince whose life ended too soon at the hands of police. Hundreds of people wearing COVID-19 masks packed into Shiloh Temple International Ministries to remember Wright, a 20-year-old father of one who was shot by a white police officer on April 11th in the small suburban city of Brooklyn Center. The funeral was held just two days after former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was convicted in the death of George Floyd amid a national reckoning on racism and police. Christina Anestead reports. All of Minneapolis has stopped today to honor the Prince of Brooklyn Center. Protesters shut down the streets of Minneapolis in honor of Duante Wright's funeral. The 20-year-old black man and father was shot dead by a white police officer earlier this month in a Minneapolis suburb, Brooklyn Center. Hundreds gathered to honor his life. Reverend Al Sharpton, a civil rights icon, led Wright's eulogy inside a crowded church and hailed the protesters for standing up against his unjust and untimely death. Marching and protesting is a way of correcting the injustice Isaiah talked about. You can't go to church on Sunday and read this book that we call the Bible and not fight against oppression. God is not on the side of the oppressor. God is on the side of the oppressed. For every Pharaoh there was a Moses. For every Herod there was a Jesus. We come in the tradition of what God's plans was, and when you oppress us, we must stand up. Wright was shot dead during a traffic stop. Sharpton's eulogy was a stinging rebuke of the possibility that Wright was pulled over for having air fresheners dangling from his mirror. Wright's mother has said her son called her after he was stopped and told her that was the reason why. Well, we come today as the air fresheners for Minnesota. We're trying to get the stench of police brutality out of the atmosphere. We're trying to get the stench of racism out of the atmosphere. We're trying to get the stench of racial profiling out of the atmosphere. Police said they stopped him for expired registration. Sharpton rebuked that, too. Well, I come to Minnesota to tell you Your tags have expired. Your tags of racism has expired. Your tags of police brutality has expired. Your tags of white supremacy has expired. The former officer who killed Wright, Kim Potter, faces second-degree manslaughter charges. The former police chief said it appeared the officer mistakenly used her gun instead of her taser. Sharpton hit back at that, too. Don't confuse guns from tasers. Train people. Don't shoot men like Philando with a child in the back seat. Train people. Don't put knees on people's necks for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Train people. 
Don't shoot 41 times at Amadou Diallo. Train people. Don't shoot at a young 12-year-old boy named Tamir Rice. It was bittersweet for some as the funeral was held just two days after former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was convicted in the death of George Floyd and amid a national reckoning on racism and policing. Floyd's family joined relatives of other people of color slain by police to give condolences to the Wrights family, including the family of Oscar Grant, who was killed by BART police. Wright's mother and father, Katie and Aubrey Wright, spoke about their son at his funeral. I never imagined that I'd be standing here. The roles should completely be reversed. My son should be burying me. My son had a smile that was worth a million dollars. When he walked in the room, he lit up the room. He was a brother, a jokester. He was loved by so many. He's going to be so missed. I don't really speak much but words can't even explain how I feel right now. You know, th that was my son. In attendance include Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who also spoke at the funeral and called for passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to reform the police. It would create a database of police who kill and abuse their power and end qualified immunity, among other reforms. Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz gave the family a proclamation, and Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar, holding back tears, gave the family a flag. The Congressional Black Caucus hung outside Congress to honor Wright's life that was taken at the hands of police. I'm Christina Onested, reporting for KPFA. A day after 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant was shot and killed by a Columbus, Ohio police officer, demonstrations spread throughout the city as protesters demanded police accountability. During a vigil for Micaiah Bryant last night, local organizer Hannah Abdur Rahim called for abolition of the police system. Rahim said, the system is not broken. There's no cracks in the system. The system was designed for white supremacy. We need to design a new one. The teenager was shot 20 minutes before a guilty verdict was announced against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, fueling renewed outrage over police-involved deaths. Officials urged calm as additional footage, which appears to show Bryant holding a knife, and 911 calls were released. The officer who fired the shots that killed Bryant, who was African-American, was identified as Nicholas Reardon, who has been with the department since 2019. He was placed on leave. The state's Bureau of Criminal Investigation is investigating the shooting, will pass its findings in the case on to a prosecutor, either the Attorney General's Office for the State or the Franklin County Prosecutor, for consideration before a grand jury. In North Carolina, protesters are demanding the release of police body cam footage after a sheriff's deputy shot and killed Andrew Brown while serving a search warrant. Keith Rivers is head of the local NAACP. People are feeling tired, people are frustrated, and people want this to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if we first have transparency, because transparency brings about trust. And when you have trust, then we can move forward in the march and the fight for justice. Authorities would not provide details of the shooting, but an eyewitness said that Andrew Brown Jr. was shot while trying to drive away and that deputies fired at him multiple times. The car skidded out of Brown's yard and eventually hit a tree. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation is taking over the inquiry on the case. will turn over its results to the district attorney. The DA says he won't make any decisions about possible charges until... The investigation is complete. In Northern California, the family of an Alameda man is demanding answers after 26-year-old Mario Gonzalez died in police custody on Monday. Gonzalez had a four-year-old son and was a caretaker for his 22-year-old brother who has autism. Family members say the Alameda police have been withholding both information about Gonzalez and his body. 
The Alameda Police Department released a statement saying that Gonzalez suffered a medical emergency while in their custody. Family members say the 26-year-old was healthy and suffered no medical conditions. They want his body back so they can conduct an independent autopsy. George Galvis of Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice charges police have begun to release statements to smear Gonzalez, calling him a suspect in a possible theft. Galvis called the statement the continuation of a familiar pattern of criminalizing those killed by law enforcement in an attempt to discourage uh, support and empathy. In Kentucky, six historical markers have been erected in downtown Shelbyville, the first in the state to recognize the victims of racial terror lynching in the state of Kentucky. Nadia Ramlagan reports. The markers are part of the Nationwide Community Remembrance Project by the Equal Justice Initiative. President of the Shelbyville Area NAACP branch and chair of the Shelby County Community Remembrance Coalition, Janice Harris, says over the past few years, several community forums fostered public discussions of the town's history. And we were able just to talk through some of the pain and some of the hurt that people were feeling. We, Our community seems to have, you know, welcomed this. We, we really have not gotten any opposition. It's estimated at least 168 lynchings of black Kentuckians occurred between 1877 and 1950, according to an Equal Justice Initiative report, which also documents racial violence in at least 37 Kentucky counties. The state outlawed public executions in 1939. The report also found the 25 counties with the highest rates of lynching black Americans during this era were located in Kentucky, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas. Harris says the markers have already sparked public conversation. And people are reading them. They're walking from one to another. We've seen that. And it's helping us to realize that what we did was important, that it's a time for us to start talking about these things. And it's opened up a conversation that people can have. It's a talking point. She believes the memorials will help foster community healing and says plans are in the works for more. I just hope that we can come together and start to discuss the issues that we have and come on some common ground and be able to work with one another and to start being a community of love. It's estimated more than 4,000 lynchings occurred in the U.S. between 1882 and 1968. In about 3,000, the victims were black Americans, according to the NAACP. For Kentucky News Connection, I'm Nadia Ramlagan. Contra Costa County District Attorney Dinah Becton has charged a deputy sheriff, Danville Police Officer Andrew Hall, in a fatal shooting three years ago. Hall faces charges of voluntary manslaughter and assault with a semi-automatic weapon for killing Laudemir Arboleda. Civil Rights Attorney John Burris says if D.A. Becton had acted earlier, she could have saved a second man killed by Officer Hall last month. Christina Anestead reports. Contra Costa County Sheriff Andrew Hall faces two criminal charges with enhancements for the 2018 fatal shooting of Latimer Arbolita. Here's Contra Costa County District Attorney Diana Becton. Officer Hall is charged for causing the death of Latimer Arbolita. Mr. Arbolita was shot nine times. The shooting occurred after Abuelita fled police in his vehicle and a slow car chase through the city of Danville ensued. Abuelita's family is suing the Contra Costa County and its sheriff's department for the deadly encounter, noting Abuelita was unarmed. They hired civil rights attorney John Burris to file litigation. Glad to see uh, that that, uh, the the criminal charges have been filed against this officer. I view him as a very dangerous man. I made a request for this to occur over two years ago. But that never happened. Hall remained a sheriff's deputy in Danville, where he shot and killed another man of color this past March. Burris tells KPFA if the DA's office would have charged Hall sooner, the second fatal shooting of Terrell Wilson could have been avoided. I'm Christina Onestead. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. This is an hour-long edition of an evening newscast. 
There's a half-hour edition on the weekends, all airing at 6 o'clock, and all the newscasts are archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. The Senate today overwhelmingly passed a bill that would help combat the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. A bipartisan denunciation of such violence during the coronavirus pandemic and a modest step toward legislating in a chamber where most of President Joe Biden's agenda has been stalled by the Republicans. The measure would expedite the review of hate crimes at the Justice Department and provide support for local law enforcement in response to thousands of reported violent incidents in the past year. Police have seen a noted increase in such crimes, including the February death of an 84-year-old man who was pushed to the ground near his home in San Francisco. A young family that was injured in a Texas grocery store attack last year. And the killings of six Asian women in shootings last month in Atlanta, Georgia. The names of the six women killed in Georgia are listed in the bill, which passed the Senate on a 94-to-1 vote. Biden applauded the measure, tweeting, Acts of hate against Asian Americans are wrong, un-American, and must stop. The House is expected to consider similar legislation in the coming weeks. Democratic Senator Maisie Hirano of Hawaii, the legislation's leading sponsor, said the measure is incredibly important to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who have often felt very invisible in the country and always seen as foreign, always seen as the other. She said the message of the legislation is as important as its content and substance. Rono, the first Asian American woman in the Senate, said the attacks are predictable and a foreseeable consequence of racist and inflammatory language that has been used against Asians during the pandemic, including slurs used by former President Donald Trump. Only one Republican, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley, voted against the bill. A spokesperson did not respond to a request for comment on why he voted against it. Hawley had told supporters earlier that the bill is hugely broad, hugely open-ended, and took aim at the hate crime reporting provision, which he said mandates all of this data collection in expansive categories that the federal government will collect and maintain. Hawley has distinguished himself among Senate Republicans by voting against every one of President Biden's cabinet nominees and all but a few cabinet-level officials. He and Senator Ted Cruz of Texas also filed the two Senate objections to certifying Joe Biden's electoral victory on January 6th, which was the target of the violent attack on the Capitol by Trump supporters. Hawley is widely viewed as a potential 2024 Republican presidential hopeful. Former President Trump has included him in a list of Republicans he sees as the future of the country. The House of Representatives today approved a bill that would turn the nation's capital into the 51st state. The population in the District of Columbia is larger than the state of Wyoming's or Vermont's. But the 712,000 residents who pay federal taxes, vote for president, and serve in the armed forces have no voting representation in Congress. The bill would change that, giving Washington, D.C. residents one representative in the House, two senators. Eleanor Holmes Norton is Washington, D.C.'s long-serving but non-voting delegate in the House. Congress has a choice. It can continue to exclude D.C. residents from the democratic process, forcing them to watch from the sidelines as Congress votes on federal and D.C. laws and to treat them, in the words of Frederick Douglass, as aliens, not citizens, but subjects, end quote. Or it can live up to our nation's founding principles. The new state would be known as Washington Douglas Commonwealth, named after famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who lived in Washington, D.C. from 1877 until his death in 1895. 
The White House, the U.S. Capitol, and the National Mall would remain separate as a federal district. Congress has held the power to veto or alter any local District of Columbia law. The limitations were on display last summer during a series of protests against police brutality in the wake of George Floyd's murder. President Trump usurped D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser's authority and called in a massive multi-agency federal force to clear out a protest, allowing Trump to pose for a photo in front of a church. It was called a critical point for the D.C. statehood push, intertwining the issue with the country's ascendant racial justice movement. Supporters note people of color constitute the majority of the local D.C. population, New York Democratic Representative Mondaire Jones. I have had enough of my colleagues' racist insinuations that somehow the people of Washington, D.C. are incapable or even unworthy of our democracy. One Senate Republican said that D.C. wouldn't be a, quote, well-rounded working-class state. I had no idea there were so many syllables in the word white. One of my House Republican colleagues said that D.C. shouldn't be a state because the district doesn't have a landfill. (laughs) My goodness, with all the racist trash my colleagues have brought to this debate, I can see why they're worried about having a place to put it. The proposed 51st state would be overwhelmingly Democratic. Republicans oppose the idea, call it an unconstitutional power grab. Republican Congressman James Comer of Kentucky. H.R. 51 is not really about voting representation. It's about Democrats consolidating their power in Washington. There are numerous problems with H.R. 51. Mainly, it's flatly unconstitutional. Every Justice Department from President Kennedy's to President Obama's has been consistent that a constitutional amendment is needed to grant the district statehood. Democrats object to the claim that D.C. statehood would require a constitutional amendment on the grounds that every other state in the Union, apart from the original 13, were admitted to the Union via a congressional vote. Biden's White House is in strong support of the measure. In a statement released today, the White House called the current status of the district an affront to the Democratic values on which the nation was founded. Democratic Representative Gerald Connolly of Virginia stressed that suffrage and racial justice were really at the heart of the matter, despite Republican claims to the contrary. There's a lot of smokescreen to cloak what's really at stake here. When some say this is not about race or partisanship, you can be sure it's about race and partisanship. A city with a minority, majority population that apparently might vote in a different way from some. The House approved the bill 216 to 208 along party lines. The bill faces a far tougher fight in the Senate. The United States Senate narrowly voted to confirm civil rights attorney Vanita Gupta to the Justice Department's number three position. Mary Sherman reports. Vanita Gupta was confirmed to be Associate Attorney General in a narrow 51-49 vote after Republican Lisa Murkowski voted with Democrats to approve the nomination. I am going to to give the benefit of the doubt to uh, a woman who I believe has demonstrated through her professional career to be deeply, deeply committed to matters of, of, of justice. Gupta will be the first woman of color as associate attorney general. She faced opposition over her positions on decriminalizing drugs and anti-Republican social media posts. Before the vote, Senator Ted Cruz called Gupta an extreme partisan ideologue. Ms. Gupta is not a moderate, is not mainstream, but is rather an extreme political activist that the Democrats want to be the number three lawyer at the Department of Justice. Republicans were unified in their opposition to calling call Biden's pick for Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Vice President Kamala Harris stepped in as a tiebreaker on a procedural vote to advance the nomination from committee. Republicans question calls critiques of the Trump administration, as well as his support for the Obama-era Iran nuclear deal. For Pacifica Network and Public News Service, I'm Mary Sherman. 
A group of Senate Republicans today unveiled a public works proposal with a much smaller price tag and a narrower definition of infrastructure than what President Joe Biden has proposed, highlighting the stark differences between the two sides that will be difficult to bridge in the coming months. The price of the Republicans' two-page outline came in at $568 billion over five years, compared to the $2.3 trillion that Biden has called for spending over eight years. The lawmakers framed their counterproposal as a very, very generous offer by the Republicans. But the unveiling of the GOP proposal also made clear the parties are leagues apart on the size and the scope of what's needed. Biden is spending time listening to Republicans and voicing a willingness to consider their ideas. But Democrats are intent on passing a major infrastructure boost this year with or without Republican support. They've made clear they're willing to use the budget reconciliation process to bypass Republicans altogether, just as they did on COVID relief earlier this year. Whether to raise taxes is perhaps the biggest dividing line. To help pay for their plan, the Republicans would instead rely on user fees, including for electric vehicles and on redirecting unspent federal dollars. Biden has proposed raising the corporate income tax from 21% to 28% to help pay for his plan, a move the Republican senators rejected. The GOP's slimmer infrastructure plan received a positive reception from the White House, with Press Secretary Jen Psaki characterizing it as a legitimate starting point for negotiations. She said Biden's aides looked forward to reviewing the details and that Biden would invite members to the White House to discuss it further after he addresses a joint session of Congress next Wednesday. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is withdrawing a Trump-era policy that would have allowed taxpayer-funded homeless shelters to deny access to transgender people. The move is partially symbolic. The proposed policy never truly took hold on the ground and was still being hotly debated last fall when former President Trump lost his bid for re-election. One of Biden's first actions after taking office was signing a January 20th executive order on combating discrimination on the base of gender identity or sexual orientation. Biden directed every executive branch agency to examine further steps that could be taken to combat such discrimination. Meanwhile, a new report from the Human Rights Commission finds a massive increase in anti-LGBTQ legislation this year across the country with 115 bills proposed across 30 states. The LGBTQ advocacy group says 2021 is on track to become the worst year for gay rights state legislative attacks in recent history. The bills would block minors from getting gender-affirming medical care and limit youth participation in sports based on their gender at birth. Human Rights Campaign President Alfonso David. Hundreds of bills have been introduced in state legislatures around the country that attempt to erase transgender people and attempt to make LGBTQ people second-class citizens. What many people may not realize is that the number of bills we are seeing, particularly bills targeting transgender young people, is unprecedented. If these bills are enacted, it would mean that states will have enacted more anti-LGBTQ bills this year alone than in the last three years combined. According to the group's analysis, so far this year, eight anti-LGBTQ bills have been signed into law. Ten more are awaiting a governor's approval. Many target transgender youth. Amy Allen is the mother of a trans daughter in Tennessee. She says she's concerned about how anti-trans legislation will affect her child and has considered moving her family out of Tennessee due to recently proposed legislation in the state. Every week, I make phone calls to legislators to tell them that these bills are a bad idea 
And last week, I sat through a hearing in the Tennessee House Health Committee and listened to legislators grill my son's endocrinologist about gender-affirming care that is sound and ethical and endorsed by dozens of national organizations. And today, we may see uh, Governor Bill Lee sign into law a bill that will stigmatize trans students who just want to use the school bathroom and locker room that aligns with their gender identity. My son starts ninth grade in the fall and he just wants to be treated like any other high school kid. At least 66 sports bans on transgender youth have been introduced in states across the U.S., along with 35 bills that would affect medical care for transgender youth. According to the Human Rights Campaign's analysis, this year is on track to reach a record high in anti-trans violence. It's reporting at least 15 anti-trans deaths this year and expects that number to increase well past the record 44 last year. Libby Gonzalez is a transgender teenager in Texas who has been speaking up against anti-trans legislation since kindergarten. The first time I asked lawmakers to stop attacking me, I was six, and now I'm 11. Lawmakers have to stop attacking trans kids. They've tried to stop me from using the bathroom, which was crazy. Now they're trying to stop me from getting the health care I need. Who am I supposed to be if these bills pass? I told my mom and dad that if this law passes, I want to disappear. They keep telling kids like me that we don't matter, but I know that I matter. The Human Rights Campaign is urging major corporations, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA, and all individuals to continue to speak up against the bills, which they call inhumane. Not every bill is set to pass. Recently, the governor of Arizona vetoed a transgender sports ban. The governor of North Dakota vetoed an anti-LGBTQ bill. The governor of Kansas today vetoed legislation that would have banned transgender athletes from girls' and women's school sports. Democratic Governor Laura Kelly labeled the bill regressive and cited possible damage to the state's business climate as the reason for the veto. She called the legislation a devastating message that Kansas is not welcoming to all children and their families. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari inviting you to join us at 7 each weekday morning for Upfront. We bring you breaking news, hard-hitting interviews, debates, and in-depth analysis. From the halls of the state capitol, to the far reaches of the globe, to the streets of Oakland. On KPFA 94.1 FM, KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM, online at kpfa.org. Join us at 7 a.m. for Upfront. The University of California and California State University announced today they will require COVID-19 vaccinations for all students, faculty, and staff this fall. Several U.S. colleges and universities also have said they plan to require the vaccination. But today's joint announcement from the 10-campus University of California and the 23-campus California State University is the largest of its kind in American higher education. The CSU system is the nation's biggest four-year college system with about 485,000 students tens of thousands of staff, while the UC system has more than 280,000 students. Stanford University also announced a mandate today requiring all of its 19,000 students to be vaccinated when classes start in the fall. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are being distributed under the Food and Drug Administration's emergency authorization. Health Experts expect formal approval of at least one by the fall. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is on pause due to concerns about blood clots. CSU spokeswoman Tony Molly said the timing of a formal mandate will depend on when the FDA gives full formal authorization to one or more of the vaccines. 
and also on discussions with labor unions that could come before classes start or afterwards. The European Commission is getting ready to launch legal proceedings against vaccine producer AstraZeneca. According to EU diplomats, the Commission raised the matter at a meeting of EU ambassadors yesterday, during which the majority of EU countries said they would support suing the company on the grounds that it massively underdelivered pledged coronavirus vaccine doses to the bloc. But according to the diplomats, some six countries, including large states like Germany and France, raised concerns about launching a lawsuit against AstraZeneca. One of the concerns, as one diplomat explained, is that a lawsuit would not guarantee that the EU got more doses. And some ambassadors warned that a lawsuit would further diminish citizens' trust in the vaccine because it would sully the image of AstraZeneca. Meanwhile, Ireland today announced it would join any legal action against the pharmaceutical company. Lucy Huff reports from Brussels. There is widespread anger amongst EU governments at the pace at which AstraZeneca has met its contracts with the bloc. In the first three months of this year, the company delivered 30 million doses to Europe compared to the 100 million pledged. The delays are set to continue in the second quarter. Ireland has now said it will be joining legal action taken by the EU to sue AstraZeneca. The EU's executive arm also says it won't be taking up an option to buy an additional 100 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the current contract. Lucy Hoff, Brussels. The world's fastest pace of spreading infections and the highest daily increase in coronavirus cases are pushing India further into a deepening and deadly health care crisis. India is massive. It's the world's second most populous country with nearly 1.4 billion people and its size presents extraordinary challenges of fighting COVID-19. Some 2.7 million vaccine doses are given daily, but that's still less than 10% of its people who've gotten their first shot. Overall, India has confirmed 15.9 million cases of infection, the second highest after the United States, and 184,657 deaths. Simon Marks reports. Just a few weeks ago, it seemed the country had miraculously escaped the worst of the pandemic. But those hopes have now been dashed, with India awash with coronavirus. On Wednesday alone, another 300,000 cases were reported. The country's public health infrastructure is collapsing, even in the capital, New Delhi, as Indians pay the price for mass religious gatherings and political rallies in the country's election season. Dr. Subia Sinha is a senior lecturer specialising in Indian politics at SOAS University of London. We've been fairly reckless in terms of allowing large gatherings and I think even the population has taken that as a signal that things are sort of back to normal. Uh, Social distancing, mask wearing, etc. had declined quite a lot. So when this new mutant came along, that was, you know, really it hit the country hard. And of course, the country is also running out of oxygen, of uh, medicine and the vaccine because we gave away so many vaccines to 84 countries as part of the vaccine diplomacy that the government of India was uh, embarking on late last year. Tomorrow, what are the political consequences of all of this for Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his ruling BJP? A man whose brand was once untarnished is now accused by his opponents of rapidly losing his luster. Simon Marks reporting. Today, April 22nd, is Earth Day, and conservationists in Ohio say that with the numerous volunteer environmental cleanup efforts of Earth Day, there's no better time to discuss the impacts of plastic pollution. Mary Sherman reports. Single-use cups, food containers, and shopping bags are among the plastic items that never fully degrade. In a 2018 study found that just 9% of the plastics ever created have been recycled. Alyssa Yoderman with the Sierra Club Ohio explains that means most of it ends up in a landfill or littering the environment. All you have to do is drive down your highway or take a neighborhood walk and you can just see we're everywhere. So many of us shop with our reusable tote bags. We recycle everything we can. Yet the problem of plastic pollution continues. So clearly something isn't working. 
Ohioans are giving not only their time, but also their tax dollars for litter removal. Mann explains that the Ohio Department of Transportation spends $4 million annually to clean up roadside trash. By some estimates, landfills will hold up to 12 billion metric tons of plastics by 2025. Shannon Pratt Harrington with Zero Waste Event Production in Southeast Ohio says the key to reducing waste is to start where it begins. For example, she argues that manufacturers are not being held accountable for the waste created in their packaging. We're so brainwashed in the idea that the packaging is somehow our fault and that if you only made a better decision to like go to the farmer's market or something, you wouldn't have that plastic packaging. But that's a little unfair when we could change a system. Man contends that state leaders are turning a blind eye to the impact of plastics pollution. The U.N. has indicated that plastic pollution is a global environmental catastrophe. States across the U.S. are passing legislation to reduce waste. Yet here, Ohio legislators are passing bills that make it illegal for communities to address plastic pollution. Manufacturers are legally required to manage drop-off sites for batteries, paint, tires, and similar toxic materials, but not plastic waste. They're also not required to help pay for the cost of recycling programs or litter removal. This is Mary Sherman, Ohio News Connection. A new report says eight California cities appear on three nationwide lists that measure the 10 worst cities in the nation when it comes to air pollution. They are Bakersfield, El Centro, Fresno, Madera, Hanford, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Redding, Red Bluff, San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland, and Visalia. The American Lung Association listed the most polluted cities in the United States for unhealthy ozone days, unhealthy spikes in particle pollution, and for annual particle pollution levels. The year's report found that nationwide, more than 40% of the population lives with polluted air, placing their health and lives at risk. Imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny said in an emotional message from behind bars today that he felt pride and hope after learning from his lawyer about the mass protest demanding his freedom that swept Russia the previous night. Meanwhile, Navalny's doctors urged him to immediately end a prison hunger strike now in his fourth week to save his life and health. And a top aide said last night's protests seemed to have succeeded in pressuring authorities to get him much-needed medical attention, which Navalny had demanded when he launched his hunger strike. In an Instagram post today, Navalny called people who turned out to protest in his support the salvation of Russia. The 44-year-old said he hadn't known what was really happening outside the prison because he only has access to one television channel behind bars. But his lawyer visited him today and got him up to speed about the demonstrations. Navalny was arrested in January upon his return from Germany, where he had spent five months recovering from a nerve agent poisoning that he blames on the Kremlin accusations that Russian officials reject. Soon after, a court found that the politician's stay in Germany violated the terms of his suspended sentence for a 2014 embezzlement conviction and ordered him to serve two and a half years in prison. The mass street protests in support of Navalny, which authorities had declared unlawful earlier in the week, swept dozens of cities and smaller towns across Russia last night. The largest crowds were seen in Moscow, where thousands marched down the city center and a heavy police presence was on hand. But unlike on past occasions, officers and riot gear did not interfere with the rally in the Russian capital allowing quickly growing crowds to swarm the streets and squares for several hours. Partly cloudy and windy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area and continued chilly with highs in the mid to upper 50s. Further inland tomorrow will be mostly and sun, mostly sunny and windy as well with highs in the low 70s. In the central San Joaquin Valley, tomorrow's sunny, highs in the mid 80s, morning clouds and afternoon sun in Los Angeles. Tune in Thursday nights, starting at 7 p.m. for Apex Express, a weekly magazine-style radio show featuring the voices and stories of Asians and Asian Americans from all corners of their communities. 
Then at 8, it's a unique mix of singer-songwriter, folk, rock, soul, country, and R&B on The Bonnie Simmons Show. Finally, at 10 p.m., The Here and Now with Dirk Richardson, bringing you a mix of singer-songwriters to avant-garde jazz, old faves, new voices, and live performances. That's Thursday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 